Good evening. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome Harriet Green, Chief Executive and Chairman to King's Business School. Um, Harriet is, as I said, is Chief Executive and Chairman of IBM Asia Pacific. And Harriet is speaking tonight in the Business School's Global Thinker series. At a time when more and more is being asked of business in relation to key challenges, climate change, rebooting healthcare, ensuring sustainable growth. King's Business School launched the Global Thinker series this year to look at the future of business in a period of massive disruption to traditional business models and sectors. And of course, we can't talk about the future of business without considering technology and those technologies associated with the fourth industrial revolution. They're having a huge societal impact, as we know, and they're a huge societal resource as well. But also, as we've seen during 2018, they raise a number of opportunities, but also a number of challenges as well. Cybersecurity, trust, responsibility. And these are crucial issues that are crucial to the mission, the education and research mission of the business school. So I can think of no one better qualified to address the theme of technology in us than Harriet. Prior to her current role, Harriet was Vice President and General Manager, Internet of Things, Commerce and Education at IBM. She was hired by IBM in 2015 to lead the company's emergence into this growing technology market. Before IBM, many of you will remember that Harriet was Chief Executive Officer of Thomas Cook, where she grew the business from a market worth of 148 million to more than two billion pounds. Harriet is also a non-executive director of BA Systems, a member of the UK Prime Minister's Business Advisory Group, a trustee of the PeaceWorks Foundation, on the advisory board of Catalyst, a non-profit focused on progress for women through workplace inclusion. And Harriet has also been recognized as the UK Business Leader of the Year and Verve Clicquot Business Woman of the Year for 2014. And in 2010, you received an OBE for services to industry. And of course, last but not least, most prestigiously, Harriet is an alumna of King's <laughs> College London, <laughs> where you studied medieval history. And also, I'm delighted to say, is a, is a member of the King's Business School Advisory Council. So, Howard, thank you very oh, much for joining pleasure. us this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you for that introduction. And good evening, uh, everyone. It, it's wonderful uh, to be with you today. Uh, some of the things that I love about being at home, you know, the amazing weather, the fabulous food, a pragmatic government, of course, I'm talking about living in Singapore. But, but sincerely, it's always a delight to be back in London and, of course, back at King's. And I'd like to begin by thanking the King's Business School and uh, Dean Stephen Back for the very generous invitation uh, to speak here today. And to all of you for making the time in your incredibly busy schedules to join us. As an alumna of King's and a member of the Business uh, Advisory Council since 2014, it is a really great pleasure and privilege to share some of these, I think, important themes on the impact of technology in the world today. And I mentioned uh, uh, earlier uh, that I'm based in, in Singapore, where I lead the Asia-Pac region uh, for IBM. And on first blush, you might not think that Kings and IBM have much in common at all. But it is interesting to learn that whilst Kings can boast 12 uh, uh, Nobel laureates in the list of alumni and staff, IBM's research scientists have been awarded some six Nobel Prizes. Now, I know that's only half as many, but then IBM is only 108 years old, whilst, as you all know, Kings was founded uh, in 1829, uh, some 180 uh, years ago. 
The reason I mention this is because both organizations share a real genuine commitment to advancing humanity. Uh, and that's going to be the theme of what I want to talk about in large part today. When I was a student, I studied medieval history. Some would say a perfect grounding for a career in business, career in anything actually. But I, uh, it taught me that by looking back at our past, we can define uh, uh, real aspects of our future. And I think that uh, we have to go back to the start of the Industrial Revolution when King's was founded to find a period of disruption that holds the possibility uh, of such radical societal and economic change as the time that we are living in uh, right now. Looking back, we can follow man's history with technology through the first and second industrial revolutions of the uh, 1800s uh, to the atomic jet and space ages in the second half of the 20th century until you come to the digital revolution and this information age of today or what is often known uh, as this third industrial revolution. Some even say the fourth. And you can see that in each successive step, uh, uh, man's connection uh, and reliance on technology becomes even greater. For some, this holds the, the potential to generate growth, prosperity, and si uh, societal progress uh, uh, that we trust that you know, technology to provide. Uh, but for others, it heralds real fear uh, and distrust. <clears throat> Just as the Industrial Revolution spurred the Luddite movement and the fear of job losses in the agricultural sector, today's advances in augmented intelligence, you may know this as artificial intelligence, and I'm going to come to that later, cause the same anxieties. Certainly, technology will resh uh, reshape professions. Uh, but history bears out the fact but it also delivers massive gains in productivity and living standards. If you read books like Robert Gordon's The Rise and Fall uh, of American Growth or The Second Machine Age I, uh, by Bryn Rolfson uh, and McAfee, or even research papers from Bell Labs or IBM, they all point to the next age, this fourth industrial revolution, being driven by AI, robotics, quantum computing, and large amounts of data that will allow us to better understand the world in which we live. Whilst many of these technology advancements are emergent today, they are predicted to reach a tipping point in less than a decade from now, in, in, in 2028, just one year before King's 200th anniversary. Now, I'm, I'm naturally a very optimistic person. It's perhaps not surprising that I see advances in augmented intelligence, in quantum computing, and in data analysis enabling this commitment to advance humanity. And I believe this advancing of humanity theme is something that King's and IBM share. And I'd like to explore, if I may, in this little speech, the connection between us and technology, and what must happen over the course of the next decade if these technologies are to deliver on the enormous societal benefits that really are possible. But to assume that things will kind of just work out for the best is too naive. Unshakable ethics, responsible stewardship, and inspired leadership are required to build trust and transparency in these systems and to the developing skills that will be necessary to deliver on their huge potential. And this is what I'd like to spend a little bit of time discussing with you uh, 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 today. Specifically, I'll explore three critical dependencies that will shape, let's decide together here tonight, the fourth industrial revolution. We must begin, we think, by reassessing the role 
an importance that trust along with transparency must play in the principles and the framework that will shape this new age that is being defined by data and AI. Number two, reinventing the relationships between business and government and academia that will be essential to driving improved standards for all. And then thirdly, and very pertinently to where we are here, reskilling. Engender trust in our workforce that if we are investing in their, your uh, uh, skills to ensure that we're all fit for the future. Before we look at each of these areas, let's remind ourselves where we have come from uh, with regards to AI and what we have learned so far. AI is something IBM began working with in 1956, when the IBM researcher Arthur Lee Samuel programmed a computer to not just play checkers, uh, uh, but to learn from its own experience. And this went on to be the world's first example of AI. And in 1968, a Stanley Kubrick released 2001, a space odyssey that depicted the the sentiment computer HAL, which became the archetypal stereotype of the AI gene gone crazy. Many films have subsequently explored this issue, and this perhaps explains why so many myths and misunderstandings surround the technology. But it has only really been in the last five years that AI has developed to the point that commercial applications could be developed. IBM captured the public imagination when its Watson AI computer system competed against the legendary champions of Jeopardy, Brad uh, uh, Rutter and Ken Jennings, winning the first prize of a million US dollars. And this led IBM to announce in January 2014 that it was creating a business, a whole business, the one that I joined around Watson. And today, analysis estimates that AI could contribute up to 16 trillion uh, US dollars to the global economy by 2030, more than the current output of China and India combined. And I mentioned earlier that I would touch upon the difference between augmented and artificial uh, intelligence. At IBM, we believe that the purpose of AI is to augment intelligence because we strongly believe that technologies are designed to enhance human intelligence, not replace it. We build capacity in machines to improve their understanding of humans whilst working with machines to solve problems that we can't solve alone. For example, imagine a country like India where the doctor to patient ratio is one doctor uh, to 1,600 patients. And doctors can barely keep up with their own caseloads, let alone spend time on understanding new drug breakthroughs in, in new treatment options. Doctors can rely on Watson to keep up to date, ingest the vast amounts uh, of volumes of structured and unstructured data and patient data to identify patterns and suggest treatment options. But of course, human experience is needed to apply judgment to the treatment options provided uh, by Watson, drawing on their own understanding as doctors of the patient and their huge diagnostic experience. So this is where man and machine deliver a superior outcome uh, 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 compared to just man or machine alone. Let's, let's take another uh, quick example. Those of you who have visited Beijing uh, will know that the city is plagued by awful smog. Now, all is being used, uh, 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 AI is being used um, to really help pinpoint and manage uh, contributors, pollutants, uh, uh, wind movement taking data from satellites that enables the government to achieve uh, its goal of reducing smog generating particle matter 
by 25% at the end of next year, 2019. Already, blue sky days have increased and pollutants have fallen by 35% from 2012 to 2017. So this is another example of man working with machine to solve a problem that alone we cannot do. And companies around the world are also using AI to transform uh, their businesses. Kone is a global leader in the elevator and escalator business. And the company recently installed extensive center, uh, uh, sensors in all of their elevators, escalators, their doors, their turnstiles, in an effort to drive predictive maintenance and reduce costs. And in doing so, they were able to collect such enormous amounts of data, which they then applied augmented intelligence to derive the patterns. And these, these patterns provided insights that they hadn't previously been aware of about how people move through shopping centers, about how people behave in city precincts and in coffee buildings. And Kone is now in the business of managing people flows by extracting value from their own data that they have completely reinvented their business, uh, 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 transforming their business for a digital age. New products, new revenues, new revenue streams. So through its powerful cognitive computing capability, Watson IoT technology and industrial solutions helps clients to gather data and predict outcomes and truly understand the relationships that are forming in that data. So Watson understands the world in the way that humans do, interpreting not just structured data uh, 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 from people in the world, but also unstructured voice, text, images, tone, intent, personality, and sentiment. Airbus is combining the data from thousands of IoT centers on its planes and in the engines with Watson so that its pilots can have a conversation with Watson real time to help with maintenance or any challenges in flight. It also provides mission critical advice on potential events, particularly weather, uh, performance irregularities, passenger issues, and security threats. And this is augmenting uh, the capabilities of pilots <clears throat> and positioning uh, uh, better in-flight circumstances. That's how the airline likes to talk about safety, better in-flight uh, uh, experiences. AI has and will continue to become crucial to the future of organizations, societies, and our everyday lives. So, so let us turn back to those three uh, critical dependencies that we think will shape the fourth industrial revolution. The first point on reassessing the role that trust and transparency must play in the principles that uh, shape this new age that is totally defined by data and by AI. For AI to fulfill its world-challenging potential, it is vital that people have the confidence in the recommendation that it makes. Over its history, IBM has earned the trust of its clients by ensuring that the data remains their data and their insights are their insights. And we have entered an era, uh, an era where companies are judged not just by how they use data, but whether we are trusted stewards of that data. It's difficult to trust an organization that is seeking to monetize your organizational insights for their own gain. And in terms of AI, IBM believes that an AI system reaches, that reaches a given recommendation uh, um, must engender trust and understanding. And it must do that for by, by being totally transparent. For example, if an AI system used by an insurance company recommends against offering an individual insurance, 
because of their risk profile, then that potential customer should be entitled to understand on what basis this decision was made. This belief in trust and transparency also extends to ensuring that no inherent bias inadvertently creeps in to the AI systems. For example, if a given data set used to train AI is flawed or incomplete, then the recommendations that it makes will also be flawed and incomplete. And this is especially important when you consider the issues of discrimination, uh, uh, whether the sex, the ethnicity, the age, the ability, or any of these factors are weighted. Training AI systems with data that may have these biases inherent within them will result in the AI system delivering bias, delivering bias recommendations and inherently being part of that bias. Important point to think about. The second point is about reinventing the linkage between government, business, academia to set the standards that will guide us all. This requires strong collaboration between industry and government bodies, and particularly technology companies and non-technology uh, companies. I if you doubt that these relationships require reinvention, then consider the recent action of the UK uh, uh, Digital Culture Media and Sport Committee that invoked a rarely used parliamentary mechanism to compel a US software executive to hand over materials related to Facebook. Trust is becoming a rare commodity between governments and some of the societal uh, platform companies. This is not a challenge just in the UK. Uh, uh, rather, it's one that every country around the world shares and one that we also need to address collectively on a global, global scale. In June, the European Commission appointed a group of 52 experts on AI to guide the short and long-term policy development around the technology. And in the UK, the House of Lords has created a select committee on AI that is taking a strong posture on preparing to lead this ethical uh, AI conversation. In Australia, IBM's head of research just developed a report to the Prime Minister as the ethics of AI in the Australian context. And in September, IBM proudly hosted the India Data Summit, uh, bringing together 400 of India's leading minds from across the government. Uh, I think there were six ministers who joined us and the private sector to decide how we best harness the innovation enabled by data whilst protecting uh, Indian consumers and others. And in 2018, IBM teamed up with 16 global companies to commit uh, to 10 shared principles of data security, and more importantly, to provide tangible solutions to data security. Signing the charter was the first step. The companies involved are now engaging uh, uh, with each of the G7 countries to educate policymakers in government and build awareness uh, uh, and developing a roadshow uh, to really uh, take to the various nations. These initial em embryonic, I guess, collective conversations now need to be quickly ramped up uh, uh, so that local and global forums, including uh, navigating the changes and the new considerations, what they all give rise to. And then the third point, which is deeply important, I think, here tonight, is around reskilling. How we reskill our workforce as roles change and different skill sets are required in this sort of 10 years uh, ahead. When I joined IBM, one of the reasons I was excited to do so, one of the really important reasons, was the opportunity it would give me to be at the heart of delivering emerging technologies that are reshaping not just business, but the world in which we live. It is a move that has challenged me hugely and required me to reskill on a massive level. A move that has driven home the sheer importance of remaining adaptable 
and open uh, to the change of it, that it's now a lifetime of learning uh, for all of us. This is because 100% of jobs, 100%, virtually no disagreement on that around the world, as we know them today, will change to some degree because of the new AI enabled age. In fact, each of the graduates, each of you sitting here in the room today will need to reinvent yourselves professionally three or four times in your career to reskill and adapt your way of thinking and your ability to apply knowledge to new challenges and to lead companies, governments, uh, and major utilities. Whilst that may sound kind of confronting and potentially a little frightening, I, I don't think it should be. It's actually very, very exciting because of what it will create. According to Gartner, by 2020, AI will be creating more jobs than it eliminates, delivering an uplift by more than a million jobs a day uh, uh, by 2020 alone. But equipping the workforce to, to navigate uh, uh, the, these demands um, requires a, business, uh, a commitment from business leaders across all countries to embrace our role uh, in, in, in responsibly putting these programs at the forefront to, to foster new skills, new collar skills. And as companies, it is our, I think, obligation to approach this in a way that protects our workers uh, and their jobs, uh, not, not just their jobs, but prepares them for the new roles. And investing in giving them the skills to succeed today and in the very, very important and soon to be here economies of, of, of tomorrow. At the heart of this should be nurturing greater analytical uh, thinking, uh, uh, greater collaborative working, and the ability to communicate effectively to our people. We have to work, I think, in partnership with academia to kick off uh, uh, early fostering of passion for some of these technologies to adapt to the changes uh, and, and the new ways of working. But most importantly, teaching uh, uh, institutions about the importance of trust and what really, really good corporate citizenship and business ethics looks like in an economy. These rules are being written now as we speak. We take this very seriously at IBM in terms of how we train our own workforce and also ensure that there is a strong pipeline of future skills, critical for the sustainability of future business. And AI is powering our own learning. And we are working with policymakers to modernize education systems like P-TECH, which emphasizes uh, the demand uh, uh, skills uh, uh, rather than focusing solely on specific academic degrees. In fact, the first P-TECH school was actually here I in the UK, launched in, 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 in Ireland. So we're also applying AI to, cre to create a better and more equitable talent economy. We're using AI to tackle the global need for greater inclusion and diversity in our workforce. And it's an area that I am passionately uh, excited about, demonstrating that I, uh, uh, AI can help reinstate trust and equality in business. So overcoming these unconscious biases in hiring and creating processes that ensure a much more diverse and inclusive workplace for all, I think are very, very critical. So much of my talk today has been focused on the technology uh, aspect of us in technology. But I'd like to, to finish by spending just a little bit on the us element and the role that we have to play in shaping uh, the decade uh, 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 as this technology that I've described unfolds. The technology industry is bifurcating. <clears throat> on one side, there are companies that make, monet uh, that make money uh, uh, by monetizing your personal information and are, and are now 
having to account to government about whether they have the right to do that. On the other are companies that drive innovation and try to protect data to improve the way in which the world works. And those that pay lip service to data ownership and privacy and those that go beyond what is required uh, by law. And one of the things that a century of experience has taught us is when these seismic shifts take place, you must carefully consider your position to make sure that you end up on the right side of history. And I mentioned earlier this unshakable ethics, responsible stewardship, and inspired leadership that is really needed to build this trust and transparency in these systems and to develop the skills to deliver on AI's almost unlimited potential. But it's by no means certain that this will happen. King's Business School has long recognized its responsibilities in its short history so far, leading from the front in terms of ethics and business, unimpeachable since its origins of the entire university a very long time ago. And I'm delighted that uh, Professor Michael uh, Etter is embarking on a new research project. It's called business, uh, Responsible Business in the Digital Age. Never has a study like this been more important. And as King's College heads towards its 200 year anniversary, fulfilling its vision of making the world a better place requires this institution and all of you, many in this room, to play a leading role in this debate, advocating for trust and transparency, actively driving public-private partnership around standards and building the skills for the future. The challenge that we face today calls to mind some advice that my mum gave me and regularly gives me. She sort of gave me a version of it yesterday when we met. And she says, you know, in life, you get what you're willing to put up with. And the promise of the world of AI is huge. And the opportunity to, 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 to do good is enormous. But we all have a role to play, and we must ask ourselves not merely what we're willing to put up with, but what future do we want? I look forward to working with all of you uh, as uh, we achieve this worthy goal in our work together. So thank you very much for your time. Fantastic. Well, thanks very much, um, Harriet. Before we open it up a bit, maybe let me just start with one of your, your R's, which was about rethinking skills. And you, know, you touched on this, about the importance of relations working between government, business, um, you know, and, and academia as well. So I'm just wondering what you, know, what you would say about how a, a business school like ours, which is relatively new, you know, how should we sort of contribute and enter that space in terms of that reskilling piece? You know, mm. What would your thoughts be on that? Well, I think to a degree you've already started on a powerful path because I think it was, I was sharing this with you earlier, back in 2013, whilst mm. the notion of the business school was, was very much an idea being formed, a council and a committee and a board really looking at ethics, trust, transparency, and how as King's brought together uh, uh, this new school, how would you equip uh, students to really understand not how to be technologists, but how to navigate using technology in a responsible way. So I think firstly there's an importance around the curriculum you know, to ensure that you are getting, you know, in front of people, the great and the good who understand how you use these technologies. I don't think anyone here, well, you may, wants to sit through four hours of quantum coding, where well, you don't code in quantum, do you? But uh, uh, <laughs> quantum, quantum computing capabilities. But why quantum might be important for the future of the world? Um, I think the second thing is really being vocal and active taking a point of view as it pertains to government and their burgeoning policies uh, and being active in stating that as a business school, one of the newest business schools in the, in the world, mm. that you are preparing people 
to ask the right questions and demand the right answers. That's, that's really um, you know, inspirational because I think you know, the, the, the government's industrial strategy is a very important element of what we're looking at at the moment. But also, you know, we very much encourage uh, faculty to, you know, engage with government, whether it's through the being on the Migration Advisory Committee or advising them in other ways, and bringing them into the classroom as well so that we get that engagement. Yes. I mean, the, the, one of the, the other very strong themes of your talk was about responsible mm. business as well and the importance of ethics and, and the fantastic opportunities that, that AI brings. I mean, what... You know, in terms of, uh, you know, when you talk to other chief executives mm. and other senior colleagues, I mean, is this something, you know, responsible business in the digital era? Is this something that's keeping them awake at night? What, how are they kind of responding to these challenges? Well, I think it is, and the way they would frame it, we, we regularly um, hold CO breakfast, CO days, where we talk to chief executives about what are the issues on their minds. And there are really four things. The first is data. Their data, uh, how do they access their data? What do they use their data for? And they are happy to have that discussion with us because it is their data. 80% of the world's data is not searchable. It belongs to King's College, it belongs to enterprises, it belongs to the companies that have been working on roaming algorithms for however long uh, 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 they have. So they want to understand how they use their data to be disruptors. Because, you know, there's, in any new technology era, you get disruptors. They come charging in without any sort of legacy. But the thing they don't have is data and all that knowledge and capability. So CEOs worry about data. Uh, the second thing they worry about I think someone American must have invented this word because it actually isn't a word, but platforming, you see? It, it basically means whatever mechanism you use to um, access your own technology and link with others. Uh, and so do you want to be a platform company? How do you want to make your own technology environment more agile, more nimble? How do you think about critical platforms? The third uh, uh, element, which pretty much from doing these in, in New Zealand, New York, is the whole issue of change. You know, technology moves at an exponentially linear rate, mm. and humans don't. They change at the rate and pace uh, that they're able to change, based on the fourth issue, which is skills. At the start of any kind of new era, the shortage of cybersecurity skills, cloud skills, AI skills, and all of our responsibility to reskill, to have the skills that the world needs, is really important. So, yes, they are worrying about that. They don't want to be disrupted. They want to know how to use their data effectively. They want to prepare their organizations for change, and they want to play a part in the reskilling that is so necessary. Thank you. So lots to, lots to pick up from what you've just said and what you said in your talk. So let's open it up. So I have one over there. My question is, you did hint on it on the aspect of data and data privacy. But in all of this is cybercrime. But I just wanted to know, what is your thinking and the approach to cybercrime today in this digital age? Yeah. There's a very important distinction that certainly the business school and others need to be thinking about. The free movement of data and data privacy and data security are fundamentally different things. So let's take our work in India right now. 10% of India's GDP is gleaned from sharing of data globally around business processing, design, etc. And India, hence our summit, said, nope, we've got to stop the movement of data. Uh, we've got to protect it. It is totally possible to protect data uh, whilst allowing it to move freely around the places that you want it to go. But yes, uh, hacking into the world's greatest new resource, using AI, 
Uh, one of the reasons that we have developed so aggressively our blockchain technologies, uh, uh, quantum, uh, is so that we're able to be steps ahead uh, of not just state-sponsored uh, hacking, which seems to be you know, the genre of today, but also very sophisticated individual, uh, uh, well-trained people who seek to do not so good things. So um, I, I, on this issue, I am concerned because if you notice, one of the things when I answered Stephen about CEOs that they didn't say to us was that they were, you know, lying awake at night worrying about cyber attacks. And um, in the first six months of uh, this year in Australia, 63% of public companies had no cyber resiliency plan that they had discussed with their board. So I don't think, to your point exactly, that enough people are asking that. That's why you're also important, you know. I, it's not good to ask it in, in, in accident and emergency if you want to be treated, but just about everywhere else, you know, where is my data going? Who is protecting my data? What is your resiliency policy? Have you had uh, attacks? And I regularly talk to communities across uh, Asia, and I was in the Philippines recently with a next-gen group, and they were sort of incredulous. Well, we can't do anything about the reason that it's important in the Philippines is the Philippines spend more time online than any country in the world. The average number of hours in a day that the Philippines population spends on hours uh, on, on um, social media is six and a half hours a day. This is when 90% of people aren't banked. So you can see the opportunity and the, and the dilemma. Uh, but they said, well, you know, what can we do about it? I, I didn't tell them what social media to use or not use. That's not my place. But questions like that uh, from their airlines, from the people, you know, that they interact with, that they live with, and indeed their own government. So we all have a responsibility uh, in that. But I don't think it's keeping everyone awake enough, uh, especially when not just IBM, but we do happen to be a leader in this area, we can protect your environment. So maybe take from a different side of uh, the room, yeah. What's your view on who shapes um, technology? Is it society or does it work the other way around? Does the technology shape society? How do you see this? Because it's mentioned the evolution of, of humanity in itself. Mm -hmm. And who drives uh, that change? It's the sort of question that you just come to kings for. It's a lovely question. <laughs> I think it's a brilliant question. I don't really know the answer to that question. I mean, I, I can give you some thoughts. I mean, I think that <coughs> society creates need and demands. Um, and, and the amount of data that we are producing, you know, from our, from our phones, from our, you know, various satellite images, etc. There is a huge proliferation of data. It's now measured in brontobytes. A brontobyte is 10 times the number of grains of sand on the planet at this time. You see, it's completely ridiculous. Who actually knows? But it means a lot, basically. Uh, an awful lot of data. It is natural that our resident entrepreneurs, that those that are thinking about these things, either employed, not in a monolithic monopoly, but in any old company, or wanting to start a new company might say, hmm, we have lots of data, or we could create something for the cloud that's a, a native app. We can participate in this for commercial reasons or for practical reasons. So I think in the early days, it's usually the technology companies that drive these new capabilities, but very quickly, otherwise, you know, no one would make money, it would die in the lab and that would be the end of it. Uh, but very quickly, it is the work between all of the communities for a healthy society uh, uh, so that we can make the right decisions uh, to get good uh, from it, not bad. That's a um, fantastic point to, to, to end on. You talked about being passionate. I mean, your own passion 
came through loud and clear and what you're seeking to do and, and obviously have achieved and are doing with, with IBM Asia. And I think a lot for us to, to think about and reflect on about responsible business and responsible business schools within the digital era. It, digital era. So thanks very much for all of that. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much.